this is the number one reason why you are not moving forward as a Nigerian. This is the number one reason why you are not investing in Nigeria. The number one reason why you have not traveled to Nigeria for the past 10 years. For those of you living outside Nigeria, this is number one reason why a lot of people are leaving Nigeria in their droves. Insecurity, insecurity, insecurity. A lot of people don't understand that insecurity is linked to the economy of a country. How safe your country is, how a country is able to protect its territory contributes to the economic growth of your country. Contributes to how many companies come from outside or individuals come from outside to come and invest in your country. If you are Nigerian and you are affected by all the aforementioned things, then you should be interested in the quality of leaders that you vote in to lead your country. I don't know why a lot of people are not interested in politics. They say, oh, politics, I don't, I'm not interested. You should be interested because the type of leader you have, the competence of the leader you have affects your everyday life, everything about you. So you must be interested. It's not an option. You must. While citizens of developed countries can afford not to be interested in politics because, you know, their country is already working. The system is in place. Even if they have a very bad leader, it will not negatively affect the, the country like that. It's a matter of four years or five years and they vote the person out and the country will continue running. So it's not going to really, really impact on the country because the systems are in place. But as Nigerians and for Nigeria, we cannot afford to do that. We can't. Think of all these developed countries back in the 40s, 50s, when they were still building their country. They were at that stage and the citizens then were very much interested in politics. That's why they fought and fought and fought till they installed great leaders. All right, that have taken their countries to where they are today. So today we're going to look into the Labour Party manifesto, Obidati manifesto. You know that Pete Obi and uh, Ahmed Dati are presidential candidate and vice presidential candidate of the Labour Party for the upcoming Nigerian election. The election that will change Nigeria for the better or for the worse. Yeah, make or break. <laughs> I already did a video where I made an intro to this series. I'll put the link below. So let's continue. Let's start reading the manifesto and I'll be sharing my thoughts as we go along. Feel free to drop your own thoughts in the comments below. So in the last video, we read the seven points. You can call it seven point agenda or you can call it seven sections or seven ways that they plan to fix Nigeria. The first one is to secure Nigeria and banditry and insurgency and unite our dear nation to manage our diversity such that no one is left behind. I actually see this one as two in one. The first part is security and the second part is unite Nigeria. To secure Nigeria, we will one, deal decisively with insecurity to put a permanent end to the incessant banditry, insurgency, kidnapping and cross-border terrorism in our country today. This one does not need any explanation except the word decisively. We know that Nigeria is bordered by four countries and then the Atlantic Ocean. The country that does not secure its borders, it's pretty much not a sovereign country. It means that anybody from anywhere can come and invade your country and attack you. So securing your borders is very, very important. At least you know that you've kept out the bad people from out, coming from outside, then you have to deal with the ones that are already inside. We are 200 million, but we don't have enough policemen. Let's start with policemen. We don't have enough policemen. Even the ones we have that are busy following uh, politicians, even a House of Rep member, you have like 20 policemen following the person. One, we don't have enough. Two, the ones we have are guarding just a few people in the society and the rest of us are on our own. So that needs to change. We need to one, employ more. We need to equip them because they don't have the right equipment. They don't have all these outdated guns. Some of them don't even have guns. So how are they going? In fact, some policemen I see, I'll, I'll be pitying them because you're a policeman. You're supposed to be a, in the security force, but you can't even protect yourself. Not to talk of protecting other people. <laughs> so they don't have the right equipment. 
they don't have enough funding have you ever been to a police barracks recently if you ever go to a police barracks you will understand why so i'm not trying to excuse police brutality but you understand the transfer of aggression to citizens nobody that lives in that kind of place will treat citizens well will protect citizens they're angry they're angry and this is affecting their mental health and they're some of, that's why some of them treat people like animals so uh, i'm not trying to excuse it but first of all provide them with these things and then when they continue then you can deal with them decisively you can like with the by the rule of law you can prosecute them right now everything is a mess yeah everything is a mess but we have to start from somewhere and then give them adequate training sometimes when you talk to a policeman in nigeria you see that this person is not well trained even the way they respond to the things you tell them like you come to a police station and report that your husband uh, uh, is abusing you and then the next question a policeman will ask you is what did you do to him what did you tell him that made him beat you up like you just instantly know that this person did not receive a single training yeah to be in that police force that he's in sometimes i wonder how our security forces work like this all this intelligence that are basic intelligence that are used in other countries do they have it at all because just by tracking someone's phone because as it works now with everybody holding a mobile phone with even the bad guys holding mobile phones calling their their victims families you see when you make a phone call your call will pass through the nearest mast so it's very very easy to locate where you are so why they have not even used this basic technology that is in existence i mean this one exists already you don't even need extra equipment all you need is when you're carrying out an investigation uh to go to with a court order to MTN or all these telecoms companies and ask them to release this data to you so I don't even know why they're not using it already so you know that something is wrong somewhere because if an available they're not using available technology it means that there's someone sitting on these investigations so the, all these can easily be solved with good leaders that are not they don't have vested interest in whatever is happening one thing I noticed that is being ignored in Nigeria is the power of human intelligence by human intelligence they mean when it public the members of the public inform the police about maybe suspicious criminal activity going on in an area because there's no good relationship with the police people don't trust the police sometimes when you go to the police and report you will be afraid oh what if i go and report and uh, this policeman is part of the crime and then he'll come and arrest me or they'll even kill me that's because you don't have confidence in the police you don't trust the police to you know that's thing they say police is your friend everybody in nigeria will tell you police is not your friend <laughs> so the trust in the police force needs to be restored when you go to a police station and you see them handle your case uh, diligently and professionally then you begin to ah oh, these people have changed though and tomorrow if you see something going on you have the courage to go and report that here in developed countries when something happens and the police arrives you see people like rushing to be a witness i want to be a witness i want to be a witness because <laughs> because it's seen as being a good citizen when you're a witness when you saw what happened you come to describe what happened the citizens are the eyes and ears of the police so this is what is not i see not being used a lot in nigeria because there's no trust between the citizens and the police so once this trust is restored this human intelligence it will help the police a lot because people that live in an area will know what is going on in that house whether the people moving in and out of that house is suspicious that's why abroad nigerians that live abroad will tell you before you do this before you know this people will call police for you <laughs> will report you to the police state police is very important i don't know why nigerians or Nigerian leaders are trying to shy away from state police. I live outside Nigeria, so I'll still be using it as reference because this is what I've seen being done here and what works. I mean, there are certain cases, for instance, if you hit someone or someone hits you, a uh, traffic accident, the next thing people will do is to call the local police. You don't call the national police because it's not their jurisdiction. You just call the local police. The local police knows the city much better than the national police. The local police are the people of that area. So they know that area better. Not like in Nigeria where I see them sending northerners to the south to work as policemen. Okay, these northerners, they don't understand Igbo. Let's see. They send them to Igbo land. They don't understand Igbo. So 
if anything is happening, if they intercept a, a, a criminal call or something like that, the policeman, though this policeman will not understand it. So you need the local police, people that are from that area, who understand the language, who understand all the jokes, the innuendos, references. You know, some people can be talking on the phone and be talking codedly. Uh, it's only someone that grew up in that area. Even in a place where they speak the same language, for instance, in Igbo land, there are some slangs people use in Onisha that are not used in my village, for instance. There are some slangs that are used in Enugu that are not used in Onisha. So the people that live locally, the, when the government employs, that's uh, the part where they're talking about viable livelihood for the youths because it's the youths of that area that are interested in working in the security as policemen that will be hired and trained and they will have a job they don't need to move all the way to another city to find a job it will be job creation one two more security for 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 everybody partner with national and subnational institutions and government so even private ins institutions can key into this for instance if uh, there's a company operating in a certain place they can invest in the security there because it all goes well for them i mean if the area around which they operate is safe and secure their businesses will do better their whatever uh, industry they're doing there will protect their lives because it's called community development it's just like all these some of these oil companies they they, in, they get involved in community development wherever they operate yeah that's uh, always the mutual benefit like a symbiotic relationship between companies and government and the people like where they are operating so this is a no-brainer i don't know why they're not doing it already in this country do you know that where i live you hardly ever ever see an army person even if somebody that works in the army wants to go to the supermarket or is working around they will be on plain clothes they they you will never see and because the army is responsible for the borders protecting the borders of a country but in nigeria everything is mixed you see army people sometimes you see army on the road not sometimes they are always on the road at checkpoints if you're traveling from lagos to the east you have you guys have on my other channel you guys have followed me on such road trips we see army everywhere why are they there blocking the road like that's not their job armies are there to go to war to protect the border of a country they don't have any business within the city harassing people for nothing so these people, their jobs will be defined for them because it's like they don't have a good job description. Even the customs people are on the road. Everybody is on the road because of corruption, because they're going there to collect money from you. How can customs clear goods at the wharf and then come into the city and wait for, the, for, wait for you again, these goods you have cleared already? <laughs> are they trying to say that they did not do a good job at the wharf? I, 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 like, I don't get how all these... Uh, uh, government bodies work in Nigeria, I'm telling you. So their jobs need to be defined for them so that everybody can go to his or her duty post and leave the citizens alone to live our lives normally. You know, in Nigeria, there's no rule of law. There's no consequence for bad behavior. That's why a lot of people misbehave. That's why a lot of people do whatever they want. So it needs to be fast. Sometimes cases in Nigeria drag for years, like unnecessary. In fact, there are some people in prisons awaiting trial they've spent four years they're five years in fact they spent more time awaiting trial than they would have spent on a prison sentence maybe for a petitive uh, that can spend three months in jail they have spent four years awaiting trial so there needs to be swift uh, prosecution process in nigeria there needs to be coordination they need to be communicating with each other very well not EFCC doing this one, ICPC doing this one, police doing this one. Sometimes it's repeated, like they need to communicate with each other, share information with each other so that it will be more efficient. Fair and transparent administration of justice hinged on the rule of law. This has been overstressed. There's no rule of law in Nigeria. There's no fairness in justice. It's about who you know, mostly. While editing the video, I noticed that I omitted this number six. I would like to talk about civilian oversight because it's very important. It's a way the citizens can assess or evaluate the job the police is doing in any society. You can call it feedback on the activities of the police. So for me, it will be a very welcome development. It will help them improve by a lot. The ministries are the people that manage these security bodies. So if your ministry does not know what it's doing, whatever else you're doing, in fact, it's through your ministry that you can administer all of the above mentioned uh, processes. So it needs to be strong. <laughs> right now, what they're protecting is the life of politicians and the 
life of a rich man. That's why you have several police officers assigned to one rich man and their families. And the rest of the citizens are left with nobody to protect them. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter if you're a big man or a small man. Crime is crime. The rule of law should apply equally across all classes because we are all Nigerians. Same law for the rich and the poor, the powerful and the powerless. This is the second part of that section one. In uniting Nigeria and running an all-inclusive government, we will, one, ensure that our administration's pronouncements, policies and conduct reflect its strong commitment to fostering a united Nigeria and the reformation that achieving that objective requires securing the lives and property of Nigerians by creatively managing her diversity. Yeah, when people see that the country is working, when people feel like they are treated as part of the country, patriotism will follow you. It's just like people that ask for <laughs> submission. I want to, uh, the, my wife to submit to me. Meanwhile, you're not treating the wife well and you're forcing submission. When you're treating somebody well, anybody, submission will come naturally. Yeah, patriotism will come naturally. You, you don't even, they're the ones that will be proud of their country because they see that their country is working. Ensure transparency and strict adherence to the dictates of our constitution in all matters of governance and the allocation of resources and projects. Yeah, not uh, everything to one part of the country. It's not, it's not going to work. Does anybody know how the politicians are paid? What grade are senators on? Or they just decide on what they will be paid and they start paying them that? Like, are they level 14 or level 15 or level 16? I want to know in, in, in that uh, ranking. Because in Nigeria, we have levels in, for career civil servants. But it looks like politicians, we don't have levels for them. They just decide what they want to be paid and they are paid that anyway, even if the country is sinking. So that's what they're trying to say here, that everybody will be on grade levels uh, so that nobody is paid like some people are not paid millions while their counterparts or even people that are, for instance, professors in universities, you cannot compare them to career politicians. I mean, politician can come off today, start buying for election and he's elected. He didn't climb through any ranks or something like that. So how, how are they ranked? How are they paid? <laughs> if you know that, please let me know. So they're going to harmonize everything so that it doesn't seem like uh, all the money goes to politicians. And some of them will serve for four years, like governors, they will serve for four years and then they get pension for life. Meanwhile, career civil servants will serve for 35 years and get pension as well. So yeah, I think that's what they're trying. So this will greatly cut the cost of governance. You see this salary one? I don't really get it. It's not as detailed as I wanted it to be. What I don't understand about it is that they said we'll do away with the extant salary structure. Does this mean that Civil servants will no longer be paid salaries, like monthly salaries. Are they part of the hourly structure? Because even here, in I live in a developed country, even here, they still have people that are paid salaries, monthly salaries per month. Yeah, And then they still have casual workers, people that work, uh, maybe people that sign up through agencies, are paid by the hour. So... These two, salary and hourly wage, can run concurrently depending on the organization. So by saying that they are doing away with the extant salary structure, I don't understand that part. Okay, If you understand it, please let me know in the comments. Hourly based, I understand, uh, national minimum rate by which the public and private sector employers should pay employees based on their actual productivity. We will drive the legislation to retain a national minimum wage. Okay, In countries like the U.S., there's something called, because it's such a big country, uh, the states are so big as well. Like I said in the first video, so, some states in the U.S. are bigger than Nigeria, a country. So their states are so big with like full-fledged economies. Their economies of these states are much bigger than lots of countries' economies. So they have a national minimum wage and then they have, each state has its own taxes and yeah, they have their own small, small laws uh, that they change minimum wage. So... I think that's what they're trying to do here. National minimum wage with a binding effect and application across all states and local governments of Nigeria. So are they saying that this is going to be one minimum wage that will be used everywhere? Is that what they're saying? Because in Nigeria, a lot of states don't have the money to pay, may not have the money to pay the minimum wage, the national hourly minimum wage. What are they going to do about that? Because that's uh, why it's competitive. For instance, 
if a state like Anambra is offering you a minimum wage of 1,000 Naira per hour, for example, I'm giving, I'm giving an example, and a state like Lagos, which is used to be the capital of Nigeria, uh, our commercial capital till today, is giving you 2,000 Naira per hour. You can move to Lagos and find a job there. The only thing is that such places where you earn more will have a higher cost of living. But if you compare and contrast and you can bear it, you go to Lagos and find a job there. And, uh, and of course, such places will be competitive, more competitive as well. Getting a job there may be harder because a lot more people live there. For instance, in, in the US, if you're looking for a job in New York, if you're trying to pay for house rent in New York, you get higher salaries in New York, but you pay more in house rent in New York. You can have a box like this that you'll be paying $3,000, $5,000 per month and you're living in a shoe box. But when you move to more inner, inner states, those states where there are not a lot of posh or high paying jobs, you, you pay less in rent. So it differs in the cost of living and everything. That national, some states will not be able to pay it. Even if it's private companies in that state, the business they're doing in that state will not be enough. They will not be making enough from their business to be able to pay the national minimum wage. That's what I'm trying to, yeah. I don't understand this part very well. So if you do, please explain to us. Submit an executive bill to the National Assembly for a Consolidated Occupational Health and Safety Act to revamp and improve the 2012 labor safety. This is talking about bills and bills. So I'm pretty sure that they've read that bill, labor bill. There was one of the Twitter spaces I listened to and someone was talking about labor laws, you know. You know that a lot of companies in Nigeria treat their employees anyhow they want. So maybe that is what they're talking about here because uh, a lot of companies I've heard on social media where some companies are working conditions, the machines they use, they're not safe. And when something happens to the person, nothing is done about it. Articulate a policy framework in line with the constitutional provisions of the federal character principle that offers opportunities to all Nigerians to serve in any capacity and in the public sector anywhere in the country you know uh, nigeria we, we there's a running joke of state of origin what is your state of, when you're filling a form uh, in any government state of origin they will use it to know whether they will hire you in the civil service in that state or not mm -hmm. even recently the one i witnessed we used to live in enugu and uh, then enugu and anambra were and part of ebony were one state and then they created uh, state they divided the state into two or two and a half <laughs> and every civil servant from anambra side of old anambra state was forced to move to anambra state yeah my parents were affected my mom first later depending on the kind of place you're working my mom was a teacher she's now retired she was forced to move to anambra state people were forced to like people the moment the state was in 1991 the state was divided they were forced to move like they were kind of sacked and they had to go to an umbrella state by force it's not like oh you can move at your own time no they were forced because of this so we are all nigerians every nigeria should be able to work in the civil service of any state because we are all nigerians yeah there, there shouldn't be that so i guess that's what they're talking about here an Igbo man can go to uh, kaduna and get a civil service job like now some people when they when they, are, they get a job in the civil service in say lagos they will be rejoicing ah that they gave me a job i'm not even from this state but you're from this country man you, you, you should be able to get a job anywhere operate a government of national unity by embracing competent nigerians at home and in the diaspora with proven integrity honesty diligence and commitment to governance irrespective of their political affiliations our government will be a melting pot of Nigeria's best and brightest in character, competence and capacity. Yes, a lot of people can support whoever and whatever they want to support. Political affiliations should only be during elections. After elections, we're all trying to make our country better. So anybody that says, oh, I'm not going to hire this person because this person is not from my party. You're, you're, you're pulling the country backwards. Yeah, you just need to go across political lines and then um, hire the best so that the country can move forward and that's it about securing the country yeah they, this is the one that everybody will be most interested in especially those that live abroad those, those that have been staying away from the country all these years because they're afraid for their lives <laughs> when they see in nigeria they'll be shouting what are you doing there what are you doing there to be honest without security in a country 
we can't move forward economically. Securing a country is the first step towards building that country economically and otherwise. Till the next video.